So I had a call about half an hour ago from a young fellow that's come here from South America and he's a white water paddler and uh, really keen to get into some white water action here in Australia. Well, hate to disappoint you buddy, but there virtually isn't any in this country apart from our artificial white water centers and up in the north, up uh, right up northern Queensland where they can almost guarantee wet season uh, river flows and you know, down the snowy mountains here in the winter months. But other than that, we're pretty short of uh, white water here in Australia. So what uh, I've sort of tapped into is the surf market. A lot of white water paddlers have come out here and we've got 30,000 miles of beaches um, around this country and essentially surf pretty much for this whole state's coast is uh, pretty good surfing conditions. It is more beach breaks, which means that the beaches are, uh, the beaches here in the waves are very close to the beach rather than some of the big point and reef breaks that tend to refract around the, the, uh, the headlands. But he asked me if I had any surf kayaks in stock. Now, I'm at, actually at the beginning of the season, so typically I make these boats custom made for anyone that wants one. They can have a green one with a black stripe and a yellow stripe down the middle, uh, such as this one here. If they so order and are prepared to pay for what that takes to actually get that gel coat to that sort of finish. Now, that occupies a mile for around about two days just to get the gel coat into this in that particular layup. And I made this boat around six or seven years ago. So it's still a perfectly serviceable boat. Um, problem is, he said, uh, do I have any in stock? I said, no. I said, I do have my ex-demo boat, which is this particular one that you can buy secondhand off me. Uh, I then remembered that on the last demo day, one of our clients actually damaged it. They did a small amount of damage right here. And how that occurred was he went over the face of a big wave and didn't turn fast enough and basically drove the nose, which is solid by the way, it's actually solid resin, into a sandbar and went boom. Now, these are pretty robust and they're designed to withstand some fairly serious impact, but as a result of that motion, uh, it has actually placed a little bit of stress around this area here. And what actually happened as a result is he's cracked the gel coat and the underlying substrate. And, uh, now, about this particular boat has had the underlying substrates repaired. I did two layers of 600 double bias on a patch underneath the wound, but we haven't fixed the gel coat. So I promised him I'd take a photo of the actual damage before I fix it, and then a photo of the damage after I fix it. But let's get into a little gel coat repair and a couple of little tips that may well help you if you get a nick or a scratch or a, a chip or a crack in your uh, in your boat surface, in your bathtub, in your shower, recess, uh, anything that's fiberglass with gel coat on it is repaired in the same way. So if you take a look here, you can see that this fissure is extending down into the side of the deck. Now this particular boat is actually carbon Kevlar reinforced, so that's given it a heap of strength underneath, but I've also backed it and put in a patch around about, probably about an inch or 25 mils larger than the actual damage area. So that's structurally sound now, but be honest, if you go out and serve it for the next 10 years and not repair this, and it probably wouldn't have a huge impact. It would in fact let a bit of water in into the substrates and possibly cause some delamination around this area. But I'm gonna repair this and I always keep the small pots of gel coat. In fact, I generally keep pigment so I can mix it into a neutral colored gel coat and match these colors reasonably close. You gotta remember this has had four or five years sitting out in the sun, being used in surf kite courses and, and demo days and the like. But how we'd fix this is uh, it's not that difficult and it's not that difficult to get a reasonable result. You're never gonna get it perfect because there's fading here. The gel coat I've got in stock is actually the original new color, been in a tin, never been in the sun. But how we fix this is like this. So the first part of making any repair is ascertain what you need firstly. Make sure you've got the materials on hand. Um, what we've got to remember is that this crack is sort of, to make it a little bit more visible to you, is around 150 mil long, possibly a bit longer, possibly about six or eight inches. Now, that crack there has also been weakened out to the margin of that uh, of that repair or that, that crack up until around about probably a centimeter beyond. So if I were to just repair just the crack, there's a good chance I'm going to get some excessive cracking here. So what I'll do is I'll 
go out around about a centimetre longer and we're going to create a V in here, so a slight like a gorge, tiny little one, only in the gel coat because we've already repaired the fiberglass underneath and then we will refill with gel coat and, uh, and then polish it back. Now the tool I would use to do that is a Dremel. I use, uh, I've got this, I don't know what, what model it is, don't really care. I go through about one every year and to be honest, I hammer them. But this conical shaped bit, which is like this, you can see that, is perfect for doing little repairs like this because I can get a, a very consistent uh, shallow V. And I always use mine on this uh, Dremel snake as well. I find that a little bit easier to use than the actual Dremel tool itself. Uh, it has its problems, but it's definitely a lot easier. So we'd uh, fire up fire up the Dremel and we're just going to make a nice little smooth cut. Remembering to extend the crack by a, a margin, around about 10 millimeters or so. What that does is stops any chance of any underlying fissures or spider cracking continuing along the line of that crack. So I've now cleared that right through back to the first layer of glass. You don't want to go any deeper than that, particularly if it's only a gel coat wound, as I've already, as I said, I've already uh, reinforced behind it. And then I'm going to mix up a little bit of green gel coat, smear it in, and uh, wait for that to go off, and then I'll come back and buff it out. Colour matching can be a challenge. Um, I always use one brand of flow coat and gel coat. Uh, I don't mix and match brands. Now, it is a problem when we get boats in from overseas. So I get a lot, uh, particularly from Canada and the US in here for repairs. And often, it's just near on impossible to match, firstly, the, the colour of white. It might have four or five different shades. So um, I generally try to stick to Australia's uh, all next resins. That way, I can sort of guarantee that the colour is going to be as near to... to uh, to as what it was originally, apart from the fact that we've got fading and you know age and the like, but uh, yeah, that that looks pretty close, doesn't it? You can see it there, it's pretty close. Now I probably only need around about one or two mils of gel coat, but the minimum you can catalyze is around about ten to twenty mils. Um, the problem with that is catalyzing it is near on impossible. So you're always going to end up with a super fast catalyst. Even one drip is is essentially half a mil, and ultimately that's going to uh, set that off at around about 3 to 4%. So very important that you don't over catalyze. Don't pour in freaking two or three mils into 20 mils because you're going to end up with a 25% catalyst. You're not going to do the job any favors and it'll go off so quick that it actually won't even work properly. This is chemistry. It's a given you must work with minimal quantity. So uh, you can see in there, I've probably got about 20 mil. So at 1%, we're talking 0.2 of a millimeter, milliliter that I need to put in there to catalyze it. So really, I'm going to be lucky if I get one mil in there. So I'm going to be at around 5 to 10% of this catalyst uh, is going to be in this jug. So I only want one little drop of catalyst, like bugger all. Oh, and even that was too much. You know, you just never need a lot. But anyway, we're going to have to work with it because I've done it and I don't want to waste any more gel coat. Quite a lot of boats out there in this colour. Uh, it's not my choice, but you know, a lot of people do like green. So another good way to, to mitigate uh, uh, a bad repair is to make sure you use gravity. Um, obviously, I'd like to get this horizontal if possible, but it's nearly impossible. It's one of those very difficult boats to work on, but you clean the wound. So cleaning it with... Um, I use the denatured alcohol again. You could use acetone. The only thing you'd have to be careful of is you will damage the uh, outside gel coat with acetone. It will certainly have an impact. Don't think it won't because it will. It'll um, it'll definitely affect it. So you put your alcohol on and then wipe it clean with a separate dry cloth. And why we do that is to get rid of that residue. We don't want that having a chemical reaction with our gel coat. And... Um, there's really no easy way to explain this. You just put it on, just slather it on. And I, I generally use a bit of a dripping motion. Just making sure I've got enough material in, but I do want it raised because I want to have some ability to be able to polish this back into the surface. And, and no lie, this job's going to take me less than five minutes. Just make sure that all of your, your canyon 
or your little gorge that you've formed has material in it and it's worked its way into the glass and hopefully if you've done a good prep job you've now bonded it back to not only the glass underneath but also to the walls of that v-shaped um, channel that you've created now if i was going to be really picky i should i could say that we should go around five to one on the size of that gel coat to get it perfectly uh, fared. But in this case, when it's narrow and it's a hairline crack, you're often better just to repair um, the crack with a little V. Now that V, if you think about it, the crack was hairline thick. I've made it around about five millimeters thick. Therefore, I have actually technically gone to that five to one ratio that we're aiming for. Now, if you really um, hate sanding, a good way to avoid having to sand this is to effectively vacuum bag it. You could put a piece of cling fill around this big over the top of it or glad wrap or whatever you want to call it, that plastic film that we put on our uh, foods and stuff when we put them in the fridge and tape one side of it and then drag it with pressure over the gel coat repair and essentially you're going to vacuum bag uh, even if it's not hasn't got a vacuum on it you're essentially starving that gel coat of oxygen now oxygen uh, gel coat's a funny thing it actually needs to be starved of oxygen to go off correctly that means that if it's inside a mold face down and this is what gel coat's designed to do is actually go in a mold face down you're starving out of oxygen you're laying up on top of it, eventually you pop it out. It's set and it sets by being starved of that surface contact with oxygen. Um, another option you could do here is put flow coat in here. Uh, I don't because I, by adding wax into a, a gel coat, it actually almost uh, makes it a little bit harder to deal with, makes it a little bit more viscous, I guess, more fluid and can make it run a little bit. So I like to do it with gel coat and then I'll wait till it goes off and then I'll wet sand it, even though it's going to be tacky and gel coat will be tacky where it's presented to the air like this. So another way that I've found to reduce my sanding and improve my job is to use peel ply. So now I'm going to actually lay the peel ply over the top here, like so. Sit it in place, let it settle on the repair at hand. Don't drive it in, don't force it, because if you do, you'll end up with a mess. That's actually flattened that almost to the surface level of the wound itself. Probably for four or five hours, I'll leave that, and then I'll come back with some wet and dry sandpaper, and we'll just polish it out. And, uh, usually you would throw this out. Now, I have a habit, I actually put this outside. I leave it outside of my warehouse, out of my shop here, um, for a very good reason. There's sometimes, this can get so hot, and it's actually cooled down now, it's been out there for about two or three hours, but sometimes this can get so hot that you'll see smoke coming off it. Now you would not want to leave anything deeper than about five millimeters in a cup here. If you do that, there's a very good chance that you could have a combustion. And uh, a combustion in a shop like this would be devastating for me, devastating for my family. Could, could in fact be life threatening, I'd imagine. But uh, I always sit this outside or we immerse it in water. Um, I didn't put any water in this. I'll put a little bit of water in it and just let that go off with the water in it to keep the temperature down a little bit, just so I don't end up with a a, a, a sort of a, a spontaneous combustion and and although it's never happened to me it has actually happened to my brother where he was um, soaking floors with linseed oil left the rags in his brand new Land Rover Defender and uh, yeah three hours later he's off at work five ago you get called in cars are right off brand new sixty thousand dollar car down the toilet because of the fire that that linseed or rag created so as a result we're all a touch paranoid here in the boardman household uh we're all paranoid about things that have exothermic reaction uh and possibility of, of self-combustion so why i've got this still i've just bought this in from outside it's been out there for three or four hours and it's a very good measure if i can touch it and it's gone off so it's definitely gone off rock solid it means that i can come back to my job down here 
and that's a very good chance that this is ready to do my polishing. So don't throw it out straight away. That's I've got to chuck it now. It's no good to keep it now. But now I've got this done. I can peel my my uh, my peel ply away. Already looking better, isn't it? Yes, I mean, even with a very rough sand, it's still going to look a damn sight better. And we're going to make sure that, A, we've waterproofed it. I mean, really, you could leave, like, leave it like that forever um, if you weren't concerned about cosmetics. But I'm going to do the right thing here and, and uh, get into that with some wet and dry and see if I can polish that out a little bit, make it look a little bit more presentable so that uh, to the new user, even if it's just my, myself, I'm um, going to have a nice new beautiful green racing machine to be uh, to be surfing in this summer. You can start to wet sand it. Now I usually give it a bit of a light sand at around 600 grit. You can use a dry sand for the first quick rough sand just to get the body off. But why I put the peel ply on is I've got that really nice sort of smooth surface. I'm almost down level. It's purely going to be a matter of take some time. Now when you're wet sanding, it's so, so important to do this. You must put fresh water on in between the sanding layers. There's no good in trying to sand with 600 grit and then immediately do it with 800 grit and then 1000 grit and then 1200 grit all with the same water because that water is actually picking up the debris and, and um, stuff off the deck and, uh, and it's going to contaminate your next polish. So you, the idea is to polish clean every single time. So I use a spray bottle like this. You don't want a lot of water, but you need enough to keep that lubricant underneath the sandpaper that's going to stop it from um, scratching the underlying or the surrounding surfaces. So very important. I'm going to start this one with 600 grit. I think I pr probably could start around 400 grit, but uh, because I've already got most of the body off, 600 is going to be pretty good. And, uh, and then I'll work through to about 1200 and then I'll give it a cut and a buff and that's going to be job done. You've got to be prepared for this because it's going to get a little bit messy. There's going to be green crap everywhere. So a little bit of water on it, just that's enough. And then start to gently polish. And you'll notice already I've taken the top of that peel ply um, uh, texture off purely by giving it a light rub. Now, one thing that I totally, totally understand here, and I want you to be aware of it, is if you start digging your thumb into it, you're going to create a groove. You don't want to do that. So I'm going to do the first one at 600 in a circular motion. The next one at 800 in a vertical motion. A thousand is going to be sideways and then 1200 will be vertical again. The reason why you want to do that is so that every time you go one way, you're going to polish out the scratches the other. You don't want to be continuing to scratch in one way. So this is my, uh, pretty much my, uh, my grit level where I'm going to try to remove the excess body of the repair and I'm not applying a lot of pressure either I'm better off to let the sandpaper do the work than the pressure of your fingers your fingers can apply a lot of pressure here and can basically create a divot and it'll be visible once we start to polish it out with the buffer okay so it's important not to let your eye do the work here it's important to let your fingers do the work and I can already feel where the high spots are, where the low spots are here. Uh, an old spray painter once said to me, you need to have eyes in your fingers to be a spray painter or a smash repairer because that's where they're, they're looking for that unevenness. And if you close your eyes, he was right. Okay, so I'm already seeing a really good improvement in this surface here. I've got a couple of tiny little pinholes, but they're still a bit high, so I'm hoping I won't have to go and do it again. But uh, it is likely that I might have to do another little small repair. But you know, it's amazing how you can rejuvenate something that uh, you know to most people would be these days in this economy a throwaway sort of item. And uh, unfortunately, I personally, I, uh, I'd much rather repurpose something than rebuild it. Because I'm just trying to feather and fair out repair and it's uh it's still noticeable but certainly uh nothing like it was you know look at that i mean really you could put that out on the water after a couple of days no one's ever going to notice that but for me not good enough not good enough pretty much if you run your fingers over it now you can't feel it there is a tiny little pinhole here which uh you know i've still got a little bit of height to work with here so there's a good chance 
you're gonna get it out. Now, what a pinhole would be is where an air bubble's gotten trapped or there's been a bit of gas rise up through the gel coat and, uh, you know, just popped under the surface as it's been catalyzing. Now, that's quite common with uh, with an exothermic reaction. You'll end up with gases coming out of the uh, out of the resin when it's catalyzing. And, uh, and during that heat process that's happening, um, those little bubbles can occur. So don't ever think you're gonna get a gel coat repair done in one sitting, especially when it's a, well, this, I consider this one to be a larger one, but it's actually not, it's not really a large one at all. It's a tiny little one compared to some of the stuff that I've done on people's yachts and, and, uh, and boats around the traps. All right, so we're moving on to our next paper grade, which is, 800 grit. Moving her up and down. You'll notice I'm working further away from the injury too. As I go, I'm actually getting further away from the uh, from the repair. Still a tiny little pinhole there, but you know, not anything that I was worried about. I'm going up and down because my next one is going to be sideways, like so. So what I'm doing is scratching out, I'm actually sanding out the scratches of the sideways movement and the round and round that I did earlier on. And yeah, you know, you'd be lucky to even see that repair now. And then uh, we're going to move on to 1200 grit. And this is a sideways movement. Now a good trick with sandpaper is if you fold it in half and it's not wet, it's going to want to flick out of your hands all the time. If you fold it over, like so, and wet it, and wet your substrate, wet your repair, it won't jump out of your hands. I don't want to attack this uh, decal either because I don't want to replace that just for the sake of a bit of carelessness. But you'll notice I'm actually fairing right down to the black here and the black here so that I can make this repair as unnoticeable as possible. That is looking pretty fantastic. So I hope you enjoyed that little uh, that little exercise there. It doesn't take long to bring something right up. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like. Don't forget to subscribe and uh, and share it out to your friends. Share it out to uh, to anyone that might be interested in doing some basic repairs. And even though it's a boat, fiberglass repairs, swimming pools, outdoor furniture, bathtubs, whatever, car parts, you name it. Uh, it, it can all be done pretty simply just with a little bit of attention to detail, and uh, and we go from there. So if you've got any ideas, don't forget to leave a comment down below, and uh, and I'll try to get back to you within a couple of days. And certainly if you've got any ideas of things you'd like to see, uh, you know, give me some impetus, give me some uh, some uh, inspiration, and I'll, I'll see what I can come up with. But uh, certainly uh, working here in my conferences shop, I'm really uh, enjoying the fact that every, every day I achieve something. And that is, for me, that is the key, is just to get that satisfaction at the end of my day's work and and if you guys get a kick out of the videos that's even more for me but give it a go guys thanks very much and i'll see you next time on the composite shop